Good morning. And welcome to worship today in the name of our gracious Lord and Savior. Welcome also to those who are watching this service and worshiping with us online. May God bless this time that we spend together today gathered around his word. We begin with the opening song, Holy is the Lord. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him, and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him, and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. And we pray. 
Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the events of this world so that your people may worship you in peace and joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first Bible reading, also the one that the sermon for today is based upon, is recorded in Genesis chapter 39, starting at the 20th verse. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered. But there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Here ends our first reading. There were many events in the life of Joseph that he must have wondered why things were happening the way that they were. He trusted that God was working for the good. We trust that as well, as the second reading from Romans chapter 8 tells us. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Here ends our second reading. And we continue with the song, Our God. Oh 
grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of our God that we consider together today is that first reading from Genesis chapter 39 and 40, where we find Joseph in prison. There are things that happen in life that simply don't appear to make sense to us. Joseph, the son of Jacob, could tell us all about that. He had been sold by his own brothers and ended up in a life of slavery. And then he was falsely accused and put in prison for something that he didn't do. There probably were times that he wondered why his life was turning out the way it was. That certainly was not the kind of future Joseph had envisioned for himself. He had been born into a very wealthy family. His father had given him a fancy robe that proclaimed his place as the favorite child in the family. It likely appeared that a bright future was waiting for him. But then, real life got in the way. Joseph's obvious enjoyment of his father's favoritism really grated on his brothers. And one day, when dad was nowhere near, they sold him to a trading caravan for 20 pieces of silver. Then they took that fancy robe, ripped it, dipped it in some animal blood, brought it home and showed it to their father, who concluded that Joseph must have been killed by wild animals. And it would be over 20 years before Jacob would find out what really had happened. In the meantime, that merchant caravan went down to Egypt and sold Joseph into slavery to a man named Potiphar. Joseph worked with talent and skill and faithfulness, and soon he was promoted to manager of Potiphar's household. Now, I think that tells us something about Joseph. He likely did not spend his days lamenting and complaining about how unfair life had been to him. He must have concluded in humble faith, even though these things don't make sense to me, I trust that God in heaven is still in control and that he will do what is good. And then Joseph served God by faithfully serving Potiphar, and God blessed him far beyond what he ever would have expected as a slave in a foreign land. Satan would not allow Joseph to enjoy that success but came after him with some strong temptations. Potiphar's wife made some sexual advances towards Joseph. He resisted, but she kept on persisting. And think how Satan must have tempted him at that time, like, Joseph, if you just do what she wants, maybe she will help get you freedom from your slavery. Or perhaps Joseph Why worry about God's will if God has allowed all these troubles to come into your life? But Joseph responded, My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph was conscious, both of God's presence and of God's will. He realized that Satan's temptations would take him directly away from God, and he would not go that direction. Now, God uses this event to teach us some things about temptation. First of all, sin is never a way to happiness. Sin will never bring freedom to somebody who feels trapped in life. Sin is always a failure to meet the goal that God sets for our lives, the goal of holiness and perfection. Every sin fails to glorify God. 
every sin fails to serve the good of others. Sometimes people try to justify a sin and say, we're not hurting anyone. But sin always hurts. Hurts the one who is doing the sin and often hurts others too. And most seriously, every sin is one that, as Joseph said, is against God. And that is something that we must remember about sin. If I'm tempted to be lazy or selfish, then I really need to ask that question that Joseph asked, how can I do this, this wicked thing, and sin against God? Or if I find that I have plenty of time to watch TV, but somehow there doesn't ever seem to be time to pray to God or to read his word, then I need to ask, how can I do this and sin against God? Or if I feel like complaining because God has allowed difficulties to come into my life or I'm upset that somebody has, has treated me unfairly, I think, well then, I simply need to ask that question again. How can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? Even at times when life is difficult or life does not make sense, we don't have an excuse to sin. Because God is merciful even then and always working for the good of his people. But it probably didn't look that way to Joseph. He did the right thing by refusing to sin with Potiphar's wife and then his life took an even more difficult turn. She retaliated falsely accused him, and then Potiphar put Joseph in prison. He suffered for doing the right thing. Why would God allow that? Think how Satan must have taunted him. Joseph, why don't you give up on God? Following his will sure didn't help you at this time. But Joseph knew differently. He believed differently. God was with him in that prison cell. God was showing his mercy every day. And the prison warden took favorable notice of Joseph and entrusted him with responsibilities and tasks. And Joseph served God by faithfully serving the prison warden. And once again, God blessed Joseph far beyond what he ever would have expected as a prisoner in a foreign land. And then this turned out to be not just any prison. It was the one where the prisoners of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would be kept. One day, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker were put into that prison. And they each had a dream that troubled them. God gave Joseph the ability to decipher the meaning of their dreams. He told the cupbearer, your dream means that Pharaoh is going to restore your job. He told the baker, your dream means that Pharaoh is going to put you to death. Those things happened just as Joseph had said. And as the cupbearer was leaving the prison, Joseph asked him to please remember him to put in the good word for him, to hopefully get him out of prison. But the cupbearer forgot all about him, and Joseph spent another two years confined for a crime that he had not done. Do you wonder what it was that kept Joseph going in those times in his life when things just didn't seem to make sense? It was God's mercy. God's undeserved love, God's unfailing kindness. Joseph knew that he was a sinner. He could look back and he knew that if he had treated his brothers with kindness and respect, they would not have sold him into slavery. And he knew that as a sinful human being, he deserved much worse than slavery and imprisonment. He deserved God's 
eternal justice and punishment for his sins. He knew he needed mercy. He knew he needed the promised Savior. And he was thankful for God's mercy. He trusted that God, who promised to rescue him from death and hell, would not forsake him. He trusted that God was merciful even when his life didn't make sense. These events in Joseph's life certainly are fascinating. They make interesting reading. But really, this is the account of God's mercy at work. Consider how God was using Joseph in his plan to bless his people and to send the world a savior. In all of these events that made no sense to Joseph, at least at the time that they were happening, God was at work to make sure that Joseph was in the right place at the right time to serve God's purpose. God was using Joseph to keep his own family alive during a time of famine that was coming. And by keeping Joseph's family alive, God was keeping the family of the coming Savior alive. If Joseph's brothers had not sold him into slavery, he would not have been in Egypt where God wanted him to be. If Joseph had sinned with Potiphar's wife, he would not have ended up in that prison where he could interpret those dreams. And if the cupbearer had secured Joseph's early release, then he would not have been there two years later to interpret dreams for Pharaoh, to tell him it was time to start storing up food for seven years of famine that were coming. God knew exactly what he was doing in each of these events that at the time made no sense to Joseph. God promises that he is merciful to us too, even in those times in our lives that don't make sense to us. We know that life can often appear random and senseless. An accident or an illness can bring pain or great loss or emptiness to our lives. Perhaps someone's mean-spirited lies make your life unfairly difficult. A loved one dies too soon. A pandemic makes life different than it's been before. And very likely each of you would not have to think too hard to come up with other experiences in your life that don't appear to make sense. Often things that we feel would be good for us are beyond our reach or are taken away from us. And we don't know why. But we trust that God knows why. Because God knows all. And God controls all. And it all makes sense to him. And through all of those times, God is being merciful. It made no sense that God's sinless son should be rejected and ridiculed, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and nailed to a cross to die. God was working through that in mercy to accomplish good for us, the forgiveness of our sins. God was giving up his own son so that you might be his own. God chose you in eternity to be his child and brought you to faith in Christ. And he has a glorious eternity planned for you. And he promises that he will provide what you need today and each day. And he will allow only what is necessary and good for you to be kept as his own child, now and forever. Remember that when life doesn't seem to make sense. Remember God's mercy so that you may stay faithful in times of temptation. Remember God's unfailing love that you may be strengthened in sure hope. 
And when you find yourself someplace in life that you would rather not be, remember that your God knows where you are and where you need to end up. Since he has given his own son for you, he will work to accomplish good for you and through you. God is merciful, even when life doesn't make sense. Amen. And I invite you to stand. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And you may be seated as we declare our Christian faith today. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At your convenience, we invite you to take part in our online friendship register. Information about that is on the screen and also in the worship folder. We take a few moments now to think further on the blessings that God gives us in his holy word. I invite you to stand for prayer. Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. Strengthen your church, your believers in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Bless the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think and communicate in ways that pr promote an informed citizenry.
Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be godly parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Lord, we ask your mercy upon our land at this time of unrest and increasing cases of illness. Grant wisdom to our leaders. Preserve peace and order so that we may dwell in safety and so that your word may be freely proclaimed. Grant healing to those who are sick. Strengthen those who are discouraged. Preserve the faith of your people, all for your mercy's sake. Heavenly Father, we also pray for Diane Block, who had surgery this past week. We ask that you will be with her at this time and bless her with healing and renewed strength according to your will. We pray these things in the name of your Son, as we also pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And you may be seated for our final song.
and we pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good morning once again to all of you. And a special welcome to guests who are worshiped with us today. We're thankful to have you here with us and certainly do invite you to worship with us again. Invite you to take the bulletin home with you. You'll have the announcements for the week as well as the scripture readings for the week. And in just a moment, we'll be watching this month's Wells Connection video. And when that is finished, you're invited to take a few moments to greet those who are seated around you. God be with you. 